All right. All right, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Phil and Doug and Karen and the rest of the team who has put together this conference. A uh, good talk so far and the best part yet to come. No, I'm not talking about Doug's talk. I'm talking about lunch in just a little bit, okay? So we got my talk and then we're gonna do lunch and I'll try to keep, keep it short so we can get to lunch here. So my name is Josh Brower. Um, I've been in IT for a little under 20 years. Uh, security just under 15 years. The vast majority of my career has been in the international nonprofit space for about 15 years, really focused on uh, network and endpoint detection, as well as training our staff around the world how the things that they do and say in the digital world impact their you know, real life physical safety situation. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Defense of Depth. Um, I did join uh, Security Onion Solutions about three years ago. I focus now on engineering of the platform as well as training. So this morning we're going to be talking about situational awareness with dashboards. And as Phil already mentioned, dashboards in this context, talking about the Security Onion console dashboards component. Has anybody used that component yet? A few. All right, I'm glad our team has. All right. So, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context, though. The first part of this talk is going to be on context around situational awareness and what that looks like in the cyber or the digital realm, and then we'll talk about what that looks like uh, more inside of uh, Security Onion using dashboards. So um, in, my, uh, in my past, I had the great privilege of working very closely with uh, the physical security and safety teams of the organizations I worked with. Um, we had people around the world in many different locations and some not so great locations. And I really appreciated that the physical safety teams really understood the, the concept of, you know, how the things that we say and do and what we do in the digital realm impacts real life. Uh, for instance, you know, writing certain things on social media when you're living or staying in a country that doesn't have the same level of freedom of speech as the U.S., right, can, um, even as a foreigner, can bring um, personal safety issues to you. And so in working through that and working with the physical safety and security people, um, I really appreciated how a lot of the concepts in physical security really carry over to some extent in digital or cybersecurity. And I want to mention just a couple of those off the top. There we go. Physical and digital security. Does anybody know what this little device is right here? If you can see that very easily, it's a wedge. Yeah, doorstop alarm. Thanks, Chris. All right, so doorstop alarm, right? So you are, uh, this I picked up from uh, traveling with the physical safety guys to some certain locations, right? So we are uh, at our hotel or location at night and um, make sure the doors are locked. And uh, for a little bit of added protection, we put this device right underneath the door. And then if someone tries to force a door open in the middle of the night, this depresses and 120 decibel alarm goes off. Okay, I'm not gonna do it right now. It's extremely loud, probably will blow out the speakers. We'll not do that to you all. What is this, um, what would correlate to this concept in cybersecurity? Go ahead and yell out a little louder. Okay, coal mine, uh, I heard alerts, detections, right? So automated detections, right? This is very, very similar, same concept. We have a mechanism we set in place, we define parameters. When those parameters are fulfilled, we generate an alarm or an alert. In this case, it's an audible alert. In our case, we are actually generating, you know, digital alerts, whatever that may look like. We also have the concept of threat hunting, right? I think my pointer is... Having issues, there we go. Threat hunting. Um, and I should say, when we talk about physical security, in my background, I'm not talking about military at all, okay? I'm talking about physical safety, personal safety, as well as corporate security, so not from a military perspective. So when we talk about threat hunting, obviously we know what that looks like in the cyber realm from the physical security side of things. Um, I would like talk about that more from a active sweeps, right? From a corporate security, I'm doing anti-surveillance, active sweeps. Um, personal safety, I'm looking for air tags. 
um, uh, depending on the environment um, and what may be happening. I'm looking for air tags. I'm looking for um, hidden cameras at a Airbnb, right? Things like that. We're doing targeted active sweeps. All right, so that would be threat hunting. Now we have this thing called situational awareness. Has anybody heard of the term situational awareness? All right, so we're talking probably half. Okay. If you Google uh, situational awareness, you'll find lots of memes, all right? Lots of memes like this. You got this. Come on. All right. It looks something like this, right? Situational awareness, right? So the, uh, the people over here are looking for the apex predator of the land. They're hoping to really get a glimpse of what's going on, and they have no idea that the apex predator is actually watching them, right? They don't, they're not cognizant of their surroundings. They're not aware of what's going on around them. Situational awareness is also the idea that when I am walking, Right, pay attention while walking. Your Facebook status update can wait. Right, there's also a physical safety issue there. When I'm walking, I'm not. I mean, I've seen a video even recently where this gentleman was walking and looking at his phone, and he walked right like into a fountain and flipped right into the fountain. All right, so just not paying attention. So at its core, situational awareness is um, being cognizant of your surroundings and the change is happening and how that can impact your safety and security. All right, now we can define from a mental awareness perspective, you know, different levels of situational awareness. This one is by uh, Scott Stewart, a friend of mine, and I'm not gonna go into details, but the idea is that all the way from the bottom, you can be completely tuned out, not paying attention, all the way to the top. If you think about this from a driving perspective, tuned out, you know, we've, my first job in college, okay, I can't believe this. First job in college, I was driving school buses, okay, up in Wisconsin. And uh, I remember you get so used to your route that you just, uh, it's like 6.30 in the morning, you just totally tune out, and all of a sudden you realize I'm already at the school dropping off the kids. I don't even remember getting there, right? I'm completely tuned out. I'm sorry for all the kids that, you know, were in my school bus at the time. But uh, I t was completely tuned out, right? I was not situationally aware. The relaxed awareness, this is more defensive driving, okay? Focused awareness, this is more when I'm in a snowstorm or, you know, hurricane or, you know, tropical force winds. I've got both hands on the steering wheel. I'm much more focused on what's going on. Then obviously we keep going up from there. The idea is that as you go to these higher levels, there's a higher level of stress and, um, uh, you need, you, it's harder to maintain it uh, as you go along, right? It takes more energy. And so we're not talking about being at focused or high alert all the time. It really depends on the context and the situation. And that, that brings us to one of my favorite quotes of all time. When we talk about um, cybersecurity, we talk about physical security. We're not talking about being paranoid at any, at any state, okay? This is... I'm just going to put my clicker down. This is one of my favorite quotes. Paranoia is the antithesis or the opposite of security culture. True security culture requires a clear head, a rational mind, and personal self-control. Right? We're not talking about being paranoid from a situational awareness perspective. We're not talking about being paranoid even in cybersecurity. If you end up looking like that paranoid guy, you know, showing all how it all comes together, it can be very difficult to translate that to a business perspective when you're talking to your leadership. Instead, security, security is a culture. It's not a one-time thing, right? It's a culture that you cultivate over the years. It requires clear-headedness, rationality, and yes, personal self-control to not, you know, say and do stupid things on social media or in front of a live audience, things like that. All right, any questions or comments so far? Okay, so that is situational awareness, more from the perspective of a physical safety and security mindset. So how does this apply in the digital or the cyber realm? How should we define situational awareness? And I, I, this is just a working definition. It's not something that you know, I'd, you know, I'd fight you on, okay? Situational awareness, events or changes in the environment that shouldn't generate alerts 
in and of themselves, but should still be monitored for contextual perspective. All right, so the, the difference here is that when I'm monitoring from a situational perspective, uh, excuse me, situational awareness perspective, I'm not gonna typically always find malicious activity. But I will find, and I've seen this over and over, I will find misconfigurations that can lead to malicious activity happening. I will find, proactively, uh, shadow IT. All right, so if I can proactively discover shadow IT happening in my environment, if you're not familiar with the term shadow IT, shadow IT is the, is the idea that um, elements of your organization are going around the normal IT processes and doing their own thing. And there may be legit reasons for that. Maybe IT is you know, blocking what they're trying to do. It may be because there's security concerns. But from a security perspective, we want to proactively discover that so that we can come alongside them and work through the security concerns of what they're doing. So if I can proactively discover shadow IT misconfigurations, that helps us greatly in our monitoring. Now the key piece here is that we're talking about changes. Or we're really talking about, um, if you think about your environment as a whole, and we're monitoring it, uh, I don't necessarily want to use the word baseline, but it's more about following the, you know, the diffs and reviewing the deltas of those diffs, of looking at what's going on in your environment. And it's not that I'm necessarily looking for something malicious. That's kind of the key that I'm trying to make. It's more about getting, being aware of what's going on around you. Again, it's the same concept that we have in physical security. Now, this is not um, new in the industry, okay? But a lot of times we, a lot of times we look at these changes as just low level alerts. These are like informational alerts and they, we view them in the alert console, which I find to be very difficult when I'm trying to explore this data because a lot of the times this data is unstructured and needs to be viewed more in context and viewing that in the alert console can be very difficult. And so that's where I'm trying to make a distinction. Now the Sigma project, um, Sigma is a rule format, just like we have YAR rules, just like we have SNOR and Siricata rules, we have Sigma rules. This is from their wiki, and you define a level um, for your rule, and it goes from information, informational all the way up to critical. When you have an informational rule, it's rules that are intended for enrichment of events, um, and then low, which is what I wanted to point out here. So low is notable event, but rarely an incident. Okay, low rated events can be relevant in high numbers or in combination with others. Immediate reaction shouldn't be necessary, but a regular review is recommended. So they have the same concept here of what I'm talking about. It's just kind of viewed a, a little bit differently. Um, you can even see, uh, I think they have it right here. Yeah, on the very top it says, while low and medium events have an informative nature, high and critical are ones that should actually generate actual alerts. So the distinction I'm making is when we talk about situational awareness, I'm not talking about let's just generate a bunch of low level alerts, wanting to look at things a little bit differently. So let's take this out of theory and take another step towards practicality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any questions, by the way? Is it making sense so far? Okay, I heard a yes, I got a thumbs up, let's do it. All right, so for example, user management, CRUD operations, create, reads, updates, deletes, you know, those types of operations. Here's a list of operations that you may find in an environment, all right? Um, users in your environment, whether it's your SaaS, uh, your SaaS applications, you know, Active Directory, CRM application, being able to monitor the users in your environment is really, really important. When you look at this list, do you see any of these that you would want a dedicated alert, like you'd want to know immediately? All right, we have user added HR group, uh, group created and permission set for volunteers, which accesses public data, user added to the volunteer group, user added to main admin group, retiring employees, user disabled, any of these, you would want a dedicated alert generated right away. Go ahead and throw it out. Yeah, the DA, right? Use added, user added to the domain admin and group. I want to know right away for something like that. Anything else in here? 
Yeah, the, the SQL service account password change, right? So I would pr personally, I would want like user added to domain admin group and any service accounts in my environment, if there's like password changes I'd want to know about and I'd want alerts generated on those. The user added to HR group, you know, I think you could make a case either way that you'd want a gener like a dedicated alert generated for something like that. But all the rest of these, we don't want alerts generated, right? This is just kind of normal activity. So a group was created, permission set for volunteer data, which is really public data. It's really not something that I necessarily want, especially in a high volume situation. I don't want a bunch of those alerts. This is what I'm talking about is, is putting all of this into more of a dashboard setting so that you can review this type of data on a regular basis, but you know, so that doesn't rise to the, to the level of needing to review a dedicated alert. Now you may be saying, Josh, I mean, that's a lot of data review. I mean, you don't know my environment. I have tons of you know, operations, you know, stuff you're talking about right here that happen every day. That's just not feasible. And that's fine, I'm saying take what, what I'm saying and make it manageable for your environment. The point is to increase visibility in a contextual, not, not, not necessarily targeted like domain admin or user account password changes, it's more general. You'll find things like, uh, there was an instance where I was monitoring this uh, in previous history where um, <laughs> there was, there was an, uh, an outside person that came in and was asked to, um, to do what they were doing, the, their yearly audit, I think it was for financials or something. And um, so our finance guys gave them, gave this person their username and password to log in as them so they could access all that data, but they needed additional permissions or something. It was something happened, it was, somewhat out of the ordinary, but it wouldn't have risen to the effect of being able to generate a dedicated alert. And just by monitoring general activity of what's going on and permissions being added from an AD perspective, we found out that, hey, this is probably not the best thing to be doing. Why don't we you know, give permissions a different way? Again, being able to have that just broader context. Uh, side note, inside Security Onion, uh, we can use Elastic Beats and OS Query to gain visibility in all of this. The Elastic Beats, whether it's through the modules, like WinLog Beats, whether it's from bringing in um, data from um, like uh, G Suite, there's lots of different modules that we can, we can use inside Security Onion to bring in this type of data. Let's talk about Shodan. Anybody here familiar with Shodan? All right, that's pretty good, probably 70%. Anybody here used it or use it on a regular basis? All right, all right, good. So Shodan is a tool, it's a service, it's been around for quite a while now. Shodan is a, a service that goes out and scans public internet, uh, I think that it's like roughly once a week, and it generates a bunch of metadata about everything it's found, drops it in a database, and then lets you as a user query that database, all right? And Shodan is a great place, uh, if you do a, a search on YouTube for Shodan, you'll find that the vast majority of the videos are all about using Shodan for you know, gaining information for pen tests and things like that. What I'm talking about here is using that same data, but instead use it for situational awareness. Okay, use that same data that people would use for pen testing, bring that into Security Onion and use that to better inform our defenses and the changes in our environment. That's what we're gonna do. I've used Shodan three specific ways over the years. I wanna show you how I did that and then also show you how to bring that data into Security Onion. That sound good? All right, so first off, let's actually come over here to Shodan. It's almost like I don't know how to use a computer, come on. You're right. There we go. All right, so here is the interface to Shodan. I'm just gonna say, um, I wanna look up an IP address, all right? So I'm gonna say IP colon, I'm gonna do 8.8.8.8. That is Google's public uh, DNS resolver. So we're gonna pull that up. Sometimes Shodan can take you know up to 10, 15 seconds to pull up the data. I do have screenshots of all this just in case it fails us. 
Okay, while it's doing that, um, we do have filters. So I just use the IP filter. You can see there's a filter reference. So you can, when you query Shodan, you can say, I only want you to show me, um, you know, filter all the data based on this, whether it's IP, whether it's HTTP, HTML, which we'll see in just a second. Bitcoin IPs, lots of different options here. All right, so we see that we have a result for 8.8.8.8. .8 we click on it, we see some metadata about it, uh, open ports, um, all sorts of information. Now this is a really key thing to know about Shodan is that um, what we're doing right now is completely passive, all right? I am not connecting, and from a legal perspective, this is important. I'm not connecting to 8.8.8.8, okay? I'm simply querying Shodan um, and the data that it currently resides in their database. Now, I could go and click this little link right here, and that will directly connect me to that link, but how I'm showing you and what we're gonna do is we're only getting that data from Shodan. We're not doing any kind of active scanning of anything, all right? So that's the first piece is, I'm gonna try this again here. So the first obvious piece is scanning uh, or querying Shodan for your public IP space on a regular basis, all right? And you can do that with uh, like a specific IP, your uh, NetBlock or ASN. This has literally saved my bacon before, all right? So we were, um, I was the primary firewall administrator for an organization years ago. And uh, I was on vacation, so the secondary made some changes. Um, I'm sure it was fine, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden, the latest Shodan uh, scan showed that somehow this person had reversed the default deny and made it default allow, so all of our publicly hosted services were now, you know, everything was completely screwed up and everything was completely reversed. And that was only because we had monitoring in place with Shodan that was showing us you know, open ports for our public IP space, all right? So yes, that kind of raises a little bit more than situational awareness, right? That's, that's an alert I want to know right away. But the idea is that as change is happening in your IP space, you want to be aware of what that looks like. So there is a, uh, a filter for network, which we can do. It's just net with the IP and then the CIDR notation. You can see that I have 16 results. This is a Microsoft Azure uh, net block, so nothing uh, sensitive that I'm aware of. <laughs> All right, so that would be network. We can also do something product specific, okay? This is kind of interesting. So we can use a filter, http.html, and look for a keyword. For instance, we can say http.html civi CRM. Civi CRM is a open source CRM product and it has that keyword in uh, its HTML page that um, Shodan is indexing. And I've used this before to track um, internal software that we had developed in a previous organization um, because there was, <laughs> there was the, the development team tended to uh, stand up dev servers and make them publicly accessible um, and also sometimes load semi-live data in them um, and so using this, uh, this particular, this, excuse me, this particular technique, I found a, like a unique keyword that we had in our software and then just dropped that into Shodan. So anytime we had an instance of our software show up out on the public internet, um, I was able to track it through something like Shodan. Again, we'll take a quick look at what that looks like in Shodan. So HTTP.html, CIVI CRM. We have 842 results, lots of interesting open ports over here. Again, put yourself, the context here is I am regularly connecting to Shodan and pulling down any diffs, right? Anything that has changed uh, for my IP space or whatever the query is. I'm not gonna be reviewing 842 results every single time, right? It's, that's the initial cut, and then as change is happening, I will be reviewing that delta. So maybe two changes happened in the week, and now I'm reviewing that, right? So I don't have to review those 842 results every single time. 
The final one, and this is by far my favorite, is host name and SSL filter. All right, this is where we drop um, a domain for your organization into Shodan using the host name or SSL. So if we find, if Shodan finds a cert with that domain in it, it will go ahead and show it. You can find some really, really interesting things this way. All right, again, using this technique, um, uh, a partner organization of ours that was in another country, um, I found uh, it just popped up one time. Again, this partner organization had a lot of very similar names and very similar sounding domains, just with a different country code, which is why it popped up. And um, you know, they had network connections to us, so we were very closely connected with them. Unfortunately, I believe it was their domain controller that uh, popped up and uh, had like 445 open to the public internet. It was, you know, it was, had not been patched recently. Um, it was a pretty quick phone call to them to find out what was going on. Hey, can we fix this before it gets popped? It probably already was at that point. But again, alerting them, you know, one of our partner organizations that this was going on because I'm much more situationally aware of the context that I'm uh, operating in. Is that making sense? Okay. So for the example here, we're going to use sans.org, our, our uh, favorite trainer, right? So we'll come over here and um, now again, the context here is this is your organization, all right? I'm not picking on sans at all. This is just an example of what it could look like. All right, search for sans.org for certs. I have three, over 3,000 results. Now, if I look down here at top organizations, you'll actually find out that, there it is right there, top products, that most of these are actually CloudFront uh, endpoints. So I'm going to filter that out. So I'm gonna put a negative or a minus sign in there, filter that out, and that gives me much more manageable 195 results. All right, so, you may be saying, this is great, Josh. I love that I can do this with Shodan, but it's yet another interface that I have to remember to log into. Why can't I just slice and dice this data inside Security Onion? Well, your wish has been granted. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, all right, so I just did a quick file beat config, right, where it's at HTTP JSON input using the Shodan API. I just put in the query that we just used did a couple things here to drop a couple fields that were having issues. And then this shows up, the data should show up here. Let's log into Security Onion. Come over to the Hunt interface. I'm gonna drop down to Log Type. And I should see, probably need last 48 hours. should see Shodan results right there, 200. So I did this yesterday, I think it was. All right, so I filtered for these results, but again, I'm in the hunt interface and I can do some group buys, but from a long-term monitoring perspective, I wanna have a dashboard that I can just drop into, review the results from the last couple days, and then you know work from there. And so again, if you're not familiar with the dashboards interfaces over here on the left-hand side, um, this looks somewhat familiar to Hunt. We actually use the same uh, Onion query language for it. I'm gonna minimize this right here. We have some nice visualizations. We have some sand keys. We have our pie chart, bar chart, and then our data table. Now we do have a free YouTube video, I think Matt, you put together on dashboards, right? So if you wanna actually how to know how to dive into making this a bit more in depth, um, I'm gonna link you to that video out on YouTube. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and look at a dashboard that I already created and then we'll edit it with our Shodan data. If we scroll down, we'll see that uh, what I like to do, I'm gonna make this, yeah, there we go. What I like to do when I create dashboards is start with kind of the, uh, the overarching category of data that I'm looking at. And when you're talking about situational awareness and the new data that you're bringing in, you kind of got to play with it a little bit to figure out what's going to make the most sense. If you can see, yeah, there we go. All right, over here on the left-hand side, I have the Shodan module, and then we have the product type and then the port. 
So that's kind of the top level uh, navigation that I decided to do for this dashboard. All right, so I can quickly filter down. Well, that's an interesting looking port. Just left click, click on include, and that filters down to that result. And then I see over here my host names, um, the HTTP statuses, and cert information. So that's our top level navigation. Then I have uh, result.hostnames over here. And then I try to look at the data set and group like kinds of data together. In this case, we have HTTP. We have a bunch of HTTP data. So we have our HTTP host, the result, excuse me, the status like 200, 404, um, location, and well as uh, robots, which had some interesting data in there as well. So as we start, you know, Let's do 200, let's include that. We can start seeing the results that are there. And then finally we have our certs, kind of that, that bottom section is reserved for SSL and everything related to our cert, uh, everything related to Shodan and certs. Now we can quickly and easily, if you see this little menu over here, we can change the type of uh, visualization. We have our SAN key right here, which we can full screen and can make some very nice visualizations. Gives us, again, depending on the data set, you can play around with the different visualizations to figure out what's gonna make the, mo the most sense when you're doing your analysis. So the overall context here is we brought in our Shodan data this is the initial result set, and then as diffs come along, right, as we see those, those deltas come in, then we can review those results on a regular basis, okay? Again, making sense? Okay. So we have less than five minutes. The key takeaway, well, let's, let's say real quick. So we started out with drawing some correlations between physical and digital security, how um, you know, we have threat hunting, we have situational awareness, and we have you know, automated detections. We have a lot of the same concepts on the digital side of things. Really the key takeaway for this morning is to understand that I think there's, there's some nuance here. There's something more than targeted threat hunts and there's something more than, um, than automated detections. And that's where I think the situational awareness falls into. And I think, you know, we use a lot of different terms in the industry to describe it. And I think there's a lot more that could go into it. For me, I found that the dashboards inside security and make it very useful being able to review that data on a long-term basis. Um, and and uh, again, it's something that I'm planning on pursuing a bit more in this next year inside Security Onion and seeing what else we can do in, in automating this. Any questions or comments? It's clear as mud, I just wanna go and eat. Sounds good. Yes, Brian. Yeah, great question. So, Shodan, Shodan, however you wanna say it. I actually have that pulled up. Shodan is extremely inexpensive, all right? I've used the one-time membership fee of $49 for quite a few years now, and that gives you access to the API. There's also a freelancer for like 70 bucks a month. So the vast majority of what you're wanting to do, because remember, um, the Shodan data is not updated. I th again, I think it's roughly weekly. So if you're doing this, you know, maybe once or twice a week, running these queries, you're not gonna need a ton of, uh, a ton of things, or excuse me, a ton of API uh, um, queries that you're gonna need to purchase. So yes, you can do some basic queries through the UI for free, but then it does require membership for more. Great question, Brian, thanks. Yes, oh yeah. Yeah, so Black Friday, every Black Friday, um, they do a deal. I don't remember how much it is, it's like 20 bucks, five bucks. Okay, and Black Friday is coming up real soon, right? So five bucks, uh, as long as they do it again this year, you can get that one-time uh, subscription or that one-time fee uh, to Shodan. Yes, exactly. You're, <laughs> hey now, yes. Where did you learn that 
Yeah, so where did, to, to bring it into Security Onion? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in the current version of the platform, this is in YAML format, and I dropped this in the, um, the global pillar for, uh, for Security Onion, and what that does is then the next time FileBeat restarts, it'll pick up this new configuration and pull it down. So I ran this on the manager, uh, directly from the manager. I do not. I mean, it's connected as in it's able to, you know, pull down data, but it's not publicly accessible. Good job. Good job. Any other questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yep. Yeah, two great questions. So first question is how much can you customize with those dashboards? Real quick, I'll just show you. Um, all right, so if we, if we drill down into the actual data, like these are the actual logs down here, any of these fields can be added as a group by. All right, so if I wanted to add um, like a geo, I thought one of these results had geo in them. Let's just say ASN, all right? So I can uh, click, I can do a new group by. A new group by will add a new visualization. You can see it added it right here. And then I can change it into the pie chart, whatever I want it to be. And then I can add more fields to that. So it's very customizable. Any field that is in that original log, we can add as part of a visualization, like a current one or add as a new one. The second question was, how do you correlate this data to other data inside Security Onion? So um, that is actually part of, um, I, I didn't end up doing, so if you look at my um, processor here, part of this processor should be renaming some fields. If I renamed fields like, um, uh, uh, I think it's the, the raw one is result.hostname. If I rename that to hostname or something like that, then you could automatically correlate it with all the rest of the data that's inside Security Onion because we already use uh, ECS, Elastic Common Schema, to make sure that all the data types are consistent with their naming. So I just did not take the time to, to really build out that parsing. But that is something that is on my list to look at because I do feel like having some sort of native ability to bring in Shodan data would be pretty, pretty interesting. So that's something that I'd like to do. Great questions. Any other thoughts? One more. One more? I mean, I'm fine with a snarky comment as well. That's totally fine. All right, thank you all very much. Thanks, Phil.